Good day everyone and we are down to our last topic for the finals which is entitled antibody detection and identification. But first, let us proceed with antibody detection. So the purpose of an antibody screen is to detect any potentially clinically significant antibody in a donor's or recipient sample. Studies have demonstrated that only a small percentage of the healthy population from 0.02% to 2% has detectable red cell antibodies. In contrast, 14% to 50% of individuals in chronically transfused populations such as sickle cell anemia patients may demonstrate red cell allo antibodies. So antibody screens are performed to detect antibodies in the following people. First is for patients requiring transfusion. Second is women who are pregnant or after delivery. Third are patients with suspected transfusion reactions. And lastly, for blood and plasma donors. The antibody screen involves incubating the patient serum or plasma with screening cells at 37 degrees Celsius and performing an indirect antiglobulin test or IAT for the detection of IgG antibodies. So antibody screening cells are group O reagent red cells. So these cells are tested with the patient serum to determine whether an unexpected antibody exists. So our objectives for the week, first is to discuss the importance of the antibody identification panel and second is to explain the principle behind the different phases of testing. This picture is an example of an antigram for a two-cell screen. So an antigram lists the antigens present in the reagent red cell suspension. A reaction to one or both of the screen cells demonstrates the presence of an atypical antibody. Some workers prefer the three-cell screen because it provides a D-negative cell and homozygous cells for the Duffy and Kidd blood groups. So the most common clinically significant antibodies react with a two-cell or three-cell screen. Initial conclusions regarding the type of antibody can often be made when the antibody screen is complete. So this is an example of a presumptive interpretation after antibody screen and direct the globulin test. So the acronyms IS stands for immediate spin, 37 degrees Celsius stands for 37 degrees Celsius incubation, AHG and the human globulin, CC check cells, the check mark, uh, it means that the check cells agglutinate, NT, not tested, poly, meaning polyspecific antiglobulin reagent, C3, it means anti-complement reagent, IgG, anti-IgG reagent. So in the first example, the tentative interpretation is that there is the presence of an allo antibody and then the antibody present is IgG and it has a single specificity. While in example number two, the specificity has multiple specificities although they have the same detected antibody and allo antibody. While for example number 3, it has a single specificity but the allo antibody detected is under the class IgM. So equally important as the de detection of clinically significant antibodies is the recognition of false positive reactions in the potential causes, reactions that appear to be agglutination but are not, uh, can cause unnecessary testing and delay if transfusions are needed. False positive reactions can be caused by ROLU, antibodies to preserve through preservatives, uh, fevrin, contamination of the sample, and presence of cryoprecipitate from frozen samples. Polyethylene glycol or PAG 
can cause false positive reactions if the reactions are read at 37 degrees Celsius. So before extensive workups are initiated, investigating the patient's diagnosis, reviewing methodologies, and obtaining a new sample are recommended. Now let's proceed to autocontrol and direct antiglobulin test. In antibody identification, the autocontrol and the direct antiglobulin test or the DAT can provide important information regarding antibody specificity. An autocontrol tests the patient's serum with his or her red cells and includes the potentiator used in the antibody screen or panel. The control is usually incubated with the antibody identification panel. For proper interpretation, the control is read in the reaction phases appropriate for the potentiator. So the DAT is performed on the patient cells without serum and potentiator or an incubation step. So testing and autocontrol routine, routinely with the screen is optional and most workers prefer to perform a DAT only if the screen is positive. The autocontrol and DAT provide useful information in determining whether the patient's antibody is directed against his or her red cells or against the transfused cells in the case of a recent transfusion. Before beginning antibody identification procedures, it is essential to obtain a complete transfusion, medical, and pregnancy history. Transfusions within the last three months present the possibility of a mixed red cell population and recent antibody stimulation. So the patient may not be aware of any red cell antibodies. So if the patient moved to a different hospital, this information uh, might not have transferred. Communication with previous medical facilities where the patient may have undergone transfusion is often helpful. Patient information such as diagnosis, race, and age offers additional clues to the nature of the antibody problem. Some diseases are associated with the development of certain antibodies. For example, a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus or carcinoma is frequently associated with a warm autoantibody whereas pneumonia may result in a cold autoimmune process. Patients with sickle cell disease can have both multiple alloantibodies and autoantibodies. Generally, patients uh, younger than 50 years old or healthy blood donors do not possess autoantibodies. Some antibodies are associated only with certain races because of the frequency of antigens in certain populations. For example, anti-JSB antibody is associated with the black population. Now we are done with our antibody screening, let us proceed to our antibody identification. First is the initial panel. So manufacturers uh, prepare panels with various antigen configurations which may include 10, 11, 15, 16, or 20 cells and be considered extended antibody screens. Initial testing of the panel cells uses the same potentiators as those in the antibody screen. An autocontrol is included with the panel especially if not, uh, not routinely tested with the antibody screen. Some procedural variation exists among transfusion services and reference laboratories regarding antibody identification procedures. The panel map or antigram is unique to each panel lot number where reactions are recorded for interpretation of the results. It is important to grade reactions consistently while following specific laboratory guidelines. Procedure manuals often represent this as the key. So this key to reactions provides a higher degree of accuracy in interpretations and the ability of another technologist to review or perform additional testing. So these are the key to reactions and abbreviations. So kindly familiarize this one. Now let's proceed to the panel interpretation, single antibody specificity. So, autocontrol, 
Uh, the autocontrol determines whether alloantibody or autoantibody specificity exists. The autocontrol is a suspension of the patient's red cells with the patient's serum. Incubated with the panel cells, so the autocontrol is read at the same phases as the panel. So the autocontrol is typically included at the end of the panel and then indicated on the panel as patient cells. If the autocontrol is positive and the DAT is negative, the potentiator may be causing false positive results. In that case, the panel should be repeated using a different type of potentiator or no enhancement solution. Usually, a positive autocontrol or a positive DAT indicates an autoantibody or an antibody produced against recently transfused red cells. So kindly familiarize this one. So these are the guidelines for the interpretation of a panel. Now look here. Panel 8.1 has a negative autocontrol which indicates an alloantibody exists in the patient serum. So let's discuss the phases. So the phase or reaction temperature at which agglutination appears is an indication that the antibody is IgG or IgM. Typically, IgM antibodies react at room temperature or, an, or on immediate spin. So IgM antibodies such as anti-LEA, anti-LEB, anti-M, anti-N, anti-I, and anti-P1 should be suspected if immediate spin reactions are detected. IgG antibodies react at the antiglobulin phase. Reactions at different phases may indicate more than one antibody and a combination of IgG and IgM antibodies. So the example in the panel 8.1 uh, illustrates an IgG antibody which was shown earlier. Next is the reaction strength. So the strength of the antibody reaction is a clue to the number of antibodies present. Reactions of varying strengths uh, suggest more than one antibody. So going back to panel 8.1, all reactions are fairly strong and of similar strength such as 2 plus and 3 plus. So antibodies such as anti-K, anti-D, anti-E, all capital, anti-E small, anti-C small, and anti-C capital are commonly stronger than your anti-FYA, anti-FYB, anti-JKA, anti-JKB, anti-S small, and anti-S capital. So the strength of the reaction also varies with the antigen dosage. So if a panel cell is homozygous, so a stronger reaction may be noticed. So in some cases, weak antibodies may not even react with heterozygous antigen expression. So that's why you need to rule out. So panel cells that give negative reactions or zero reactions with all the tested phases are used to rule out antibodies. So please refer to panel 8.2 which will be shown later on the next slide. So you must begin with the first negative panel cell reaction which is cell 2. So looking across the panel, place a line through the antigen specificity that is positive or plus sign on the panel. If an antigen antibody reaction did not occur, the antibody did not react with the antigen on the panel cell and it can be eliminated as a possible antibody. Panel cells that are heterozygous, particularly in the DAFI, KID, and MNS system, should not be crossed out because the antibody might have been too weak to react or is exhibiting dosage. Continue ruling out using the panel cells that gave a negative reaction, the process of ruling out has narrowed the antibody possibilities down to anti-K and anti-LUA. So this is what I'm talking about. 
So the interpretation for this panel 8.2, anti-K and anti-LUA are not crossed out. So anti-K matches the reaction pattern. Three positive cells and three negative cells are demonstrating, satisfying the rule of three, which will be discussed later on our uh, topic or lesson. So note that cell 7, as you can see, is homozygous for the K gene, capital K gene. So the reaction is stronger showing dosage with this panel cell as compared with cells number 1 and 3. So the plus sign means that the antigen is present. The zero indicates that the antigen is absent. After ruling out, the next thing that you're gonna do is to match the pattern. So it is the next step in panel interpretation to look at the reactions that are positive and match the pattern. So when a single antibody is present, the pattern of reactions observed matches one of the antigen columns. So let's say, for example, so agglutination was observed with uh, panel cells 1, 3, and 7 in the capital K antigen is present on these cells. Therefore, the antibody identity is anti-K, capital. So the other potential antibody specificity is not ruled out. Why? Because LUA is a low-frequency antigen, so which accounts for less than 2% of the population. Because the antigens are rare in in the population, so the probability of producing an antibody to them is low. For this reason, they can be ruled out without further testing. So additional antigens that are of low frequency in the population that are sometimes listed on panels are capital V, capital CW, capital K, small p, small a, and JSA antibodies. So to these antigens are also typically ruled out but may be considered if the patient has been um, multiply transfused or has an incompatible cross match. A special antigen typing column is often found on a panel antigram that may also provide clues if reactions do not fall within the patterns of the more commonly found antibodies. Now let's proceed to the rule of three, which is the next guide or guideline. So identifying antibodies involves performing tests and making a conclusion based on antibody reaction patterns. To make a scientific conclusion, these reactions must be statistically greater than the reactions in a random event. So the p-value or the probability value must be 0.05 or less for identification to be considered valid. So to obtain this probability, at least three antigen positive red cells that react and three antigen negative red cells that do not react should be observed. So that's the rule of three. Now in this example, so three antigen positive cells, as you can see in the panel cells one, three, and seven, and seven antigen negative cells, which can be seen on panel cells 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and 10 were observed. So therefore, the rule of 3 was met. If there were not enough cells in this panel to determine sufficient probability, additional cells from another panel would be selected for testing. So this panel is known as a selected cell panel. Now let's proceed to the patient's phenotype. So testing red cells should be performed only if no recent transfusions have occurred. So red cells from transfused donor units may remain in the circulation for three months and may cause misleading and incorrect results if different cell populations are present. So the accurate phenotype of a recently transfused patient would necessitate cell separation techniques to separate transfused and autologous red cells. 
We also have multiple antibodies. So when patients have more than one antibody, additional techniques are needed in order to resolve the problem. So like for example, so following the guidelines uh, outlined uh, which was presented uh, earlier in the previous slide, so we can conclude uh, based on those guidelines, uh, we can conclude that the in this panel 8.3 that the autocontrol is negative and an allo antibody should be suspected. So reactions only at the anti-human globulin or AHG phase suggest an IgG antibody. So the reaction strength is variable. So it can be observed from 1 plus to 3 plus which suggests more than one antibody and or an antibody that exhibits dosage effect. Anti-capital E and anti-FYA cannot be ruled out after crossing out antigens that did not react with the antibody. Matching the pattern is more difficult uh, when more than one antibody specificity exists. So under the rule of three, Two uh, capital E positive panel cells were reactive, panel cells 3 and 5 with the patient sample. However, panel cell number 5 is positive for both capital E and capital FYA antigens and cannot be included. So 4 and 4 E negative panel cells were non-reactive as you can see on panel cells 1, 2, 8, and 10. And then the rule of 3 was not met for confirmation of anti-capital E. So two more E-positive panel cells that are FYA negative need to be tested. So five FYA positive panel cells reacted. So it can be seen on panel cells uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 9 with the patient sample. However, panel cell 5 is positive for both E and FYA antigens and cannot be included. For FYA negative panel cells, so it can be seen on panel cells 1, 2, 8, and 10, were non-reactive. So the rule of 3 was not, uh, the, the rule of 3 was met rather for confirmation of anti-FYA. So anti-FYA is showing, also showing dosage effect uh, in the panel. Uh, panel cells 4 and 6 are FYE positive, B negative, and have a 2 plus reactivity. So panel cells 7 and 9 are FYA positive, B positive, and have a 1 plus reactivity. So the patient's red cell phenotype is E negative and FYA negative, providing additional support that these antibodies could be present. So how are we going to resolve multiple antibodies? So selected cells are often used to complete the requirements for the rule of three to confirm the antibody specificities that are initially suspected. Cells may be selected from other panels without running the entire panel. In this example, panel 8.4 shows another panel that can be used to select additional E-positive FYA negative cells. Panel cells 3 and 10 are E-positive and FYA negative. So when tested with the patient serum, 3 plus reactivity is observed in the AHG phase of the panel. Anti-E anti -E rather specificity has now been confirmed by the rule of 3. So if the same panel manufacturer is used to select more cells, it is important to check that the donor number or the code is not the same as the panel cell used in the original panel. So this number is usually indicated in the first column of the panel. The donor codes for the selected cells used in panel 8.4 are 45 and uh, 92, which are not the same as the original cells in panel 8.3. If the number were the same, it would mean that 
the same panel cell is being repeated. It is also important to remember that negative reacting screening cells in initial testing may provide additional information for confirmation. So this shows the enzyme treatment summary. Uh, proteolytic enzymes can be used to eliminate or enhance antibody activity. So the FYA, FYB, capital S, capital M, and capital N antigenic activity is eliminated using enzyme methods. So however, the antibodies to antigens of the RH, KID, and Lewis systems are greatly enhanced using enzymes in the test system. So enzymes act by removing the sialic acid residues from the red cell membrane, eliminating some red cell antigens while exposing others. So we also have additional techniques on detecting uh, multiple antibodies. So one is the one-stage enzyme technique in which in a one-stage procedure, patient serum uh, enzyme such as your papain and red cells are incubated together. While in the two-stage enzyme technique, so the panel or screening cells are pre-treated with enzymes such as your fissin or papain and washed. So the pre-treated cells are used without other enhancement media in the antiglobulin test. Enzyme-treated red cells can be prepared before use or purchased commercially. So let's have this example. So after enzyme treatment, red cells are retested with the serum to determine whether the antibody or mixture of antibodies is still reacting. So in the example shown in panel 8.5, the following conclusions can be made. So panel 8.5, so this is a fissine treated panel. So uh, the, the first conclusion that we can make is uh, if there is no agglutination present after, in, after enzyme treatment, so the loss of panel cell reactions indicates that an antibody present in the patient sample was specific for an antigen denatured by enzymes. So panel cells 4, 6, 7, and 9 were not reactive after fissine treatment because the FYA antigen was denatured and the anti-FYA in the patient sample had no antigen for antibody binding. And then second, panel cell number 5 could be used to confirm uh, the anti-capital E specificity. So the FYA antigen was eliminated with fissin and the anti-capital E reaction remained. So when using an enzyme-treated cell, observing agglutination only at the AHG phase is recommended to avoid false positive reactions. So because enzymes denature some antigens, it should not be used as the only antibody detection or, ad or identification method. Next, we also have this example. So by using the panel interpretation guidelines, which was shown previously on the uh, previous slides. So the following conclusions can be made to give direction for additional testing. So first is that in this panel, so the autocontrol is negative, therefore an allo antibody should be suspected. Then the phases show that the reactions are occurring only at the AHG phase, which suggests that an IgG antibody is present. So the reaction strengths are similar in reaction strength. So 2 plus and uh, to 3 plus, so which suggests a single specificity. So because only one negative cell exists on the panel, panel cell number 7 eliminates the possibility of anti-small C, anti-small E, anti-small F, anti-capital M, anti-capital S, anti-LEB, anti-LUB, anti-capital K, and anti-JKB. Antibodies that are not ruled out are anti-capital D, anti-capital C, anti-capital E, anti-capital CW, anti-capital N, anti-small s, anti-P1, 
anti LEA, anti LUA, anti small k, anti JKA. So these uh, specificities remain as possible antibodies in the sample because the antigens FYA and FYB are heterozygous on panel cell number 7, they should not be used to rule out potential antibodies to these antigens. So in matching the pattern, anti-small K fits the pattern under the small K antigen column when looking across at the potential specificities because it was not ruled out, so the tentative antibody identification is an anti-small K. So under the rule of 3, two additional uh, small K negative cells need to be selected from other panels and tested to conclude that an anti-small K exists. The frequency of being negative for the small K antigen is less than 1 in 500, therefore, the patient is K negative, small K negative. So the specificity is probably anti small K. So that ends our discussion with regards to antibody uh, identification. So we are done discussing with antibody screening and we are also done with antibody identification. So now let us proceed to the materials and equipments uh, that will be used for performing this experiment or performing the test. So we have our Wasserman test tubes, test tube rack, gum label, water bath set up. So it can be set at 37 degrees Celsius, then gloves, uh, centrifuge, pasture pipette, marking pen, and your Nesco film. The reagents or samples are the following. So we have anti-human globulin reagent. We have screening cells 1 and 2 or SC1, SC2, panel cells 1 to 11. It can be labeled as uh, AB dash capital C1 to AB dash capital C11. We also have your Coombs check cells and of course our normal saline solution with at least 0.85% to 0.9% of sodium chloride. It can be placed in a washed bottle. Now for the procedure on performing antibody screening, so prepare two test tubes and follow this table. So for the unknown serum, two drops for cell 1 and two drops for cell 2. Screening cell 1, two drops, and then screening cell 2, two drops. Next is for our immediate spin phase. So you can mix the contents, cover the tubes with Nesco film, then centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3,400 RPM. After that, dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. Record the result from the given antibody screening antigram. If no agglutination is observed, we are going to proceed to the next step, which is the incubation phase or the 37 degrees Celsius phase. Incubate the tube showing no agglutination at 37 degree Celsius water bath for 15 minutes and then centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3,400 RPM then dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination then record the result from the given antibody screening antigram if no agglutination is observed then you may proceed to the next phase which is the AHG phase or the anti-human globulin phase so what you're gonna do is that you're gonna wash the unknown tube showing agglutination three times with NSS, then decant completely after the last washing. After that, you must add two drops of your AHG serum and then mix well, cover the tube with Nesco film. Centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3400 RPM. Dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. Record the results from the given antibody screening antigram and please take note that agglutination indicated uh, the presence of atypical antibodies in the patient serum, then no agglutination indicates the absence of atypical antibodies in the patient serum. If the test does not show agglutination, so you can add one drop of Coombs check cells to the unknown tube and centrifuge for 15 seconds. Dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. Next is the procedure for antibody identification. 
So the first thing that you're gonna do for the procedure of antibody identification is to prepare 11 tubes and then label them as uh, AB-C1 to AB-C11 and then follow the table presented on this slide. Next is we are going to perform your immediate spin uh, phase or the IS phase. So you're going to mix the contents and centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3,400 RPM. Then dislatch the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. Record the result from the given antibody identification antigram. If no agglutination is observed, then you can proceed to the next phase. So which is the incubation phase or the 37 degrees Celsius phase. Incubate the tube showing no agglutination for 15 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius water bath. After that, centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3,400 RPM. Then dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. So record the result from the given antibody identification antigram. If no agglutination is observed, then proceed to the next phase, which is the anti-human globulin phase or the AHG phase. So, wash the unknown tube showing no agglutination three times with NSS, then decan completely after the last washing. Add two drops of anti-human globulin serum and mix well, then cover the tube with NASCO film. After that, centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3,400 RPM. Then dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination. Record the result from the given antibody screening and ident antibody identification antigram. So please take note that agglutination indicated the presence of atypical antibodies in the patient serum. No agglutination indicates that uh, the absence of atypical antibodies in the patient serum. So if the test does not show agglutination then you can add one drop of our combs check cells to the unknown tube and centrifuge for 15 seconds at 3400 rpm lastly dislodge the cell button gently and observe for agglutination so antibody screening and antibody identification procedure are somehow similar uh, they differ only on the reagents or the samples that are used for performing the test. And that concludes our final topic for antibody detection and identification. Thank you so much everyone and I hope that you have learned something from this video. God bless you all.